I'm Nicholas Bell. I'm uh, the chief film critic at a website called ioncinema.com, and I'm here with Tom Sturges, son of director Preston Sturges, to talk about uh, the Criterion's re-release of The Lady Eve, uh, which I, I believe came out July 14th, 2020. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually excited uh, to talk to you. This is my favorite Preston Sturges film. As, is, um, so as as it is mine, but it's my view is a little different. Whichever one of his films I'm talking about, that's my favorite. Okay, now, I was going to ask that because actually <laughs> I picked up a copy of your book um, that you published last year with Nick Smedley. Um, yeah, uh, which is a, a, about your father, but uh, the parenthetical is the last years of Hollywood's first writer director. Um, and in the book, um, which is I, I love how it's organized and. Uh, you call, uh, the Lady Eve his first, uh, actual masterpiece and, you know, and, you know, you run down, um, the films that are considered masterpieces and I, I was gonna ask if you had a favorite of those, but. Well, I, you know, I think the, uh, one of the, one of the things about my dad's pictures that I've come to realize now, especially because they, uh, they've been part of my life, my whole life, is how well they stand the test of time. Um, and unlike the big gory dramas that were being shot around that time, th- his films particularly, um, they're not r- really, they're not sexist, they're not misogynist, they're, they're just, uh, they're so current and real and, you know, people feeling sadness when their hearts are broken and elation when they pull off a giant scam and all, all the other things. It's just, it's almost like a documentary of life in the 40s, his films are to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, his films definitely define, I, I think, in retrospect, what we understand of that decade and, and people's sentiments. And yeah, I, I agree that they also hold up um, both for universality. And, and I think, especially with Lady Eve, actually, there's, uh, it, it's non misogynistic. It, at all, like it, to me, this is his strongest uh, female character by far. Uh, but, well, but definitely. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna. I'm just gonna interrupt you to say, and I'm sorry to interrupt you to say it. Um, that my dad would often, as a story point, put a very, very smart woman at the center of the action and have all the men in the film spinning around her like uh, spokes on a wheel. And that's the Palm Beach story. That's uh, um, that's Miracle Morgan's Creek. Uh, and But it's really, really most strongly stated, I think, in The Lady Eve, because it's all yeah. her. Yes. Yeah, it, it definitely, it, it's Barbara Stanwyck, who is also a favorite of mine, uh, yeah, owns the film. Um, and, and also uh, in your father's screenplay, before uh, he started directing, I get a lot of similarities with Easy Living um, and the Gene Arthur character a little bit with mm-hmm. what you said. It's the totally, movie. it's totally in Easy Living. It's the first time I think he tried it, but also very much in uh, Remember the Night. Is it that with Stanwyck, uh, the character yeah. of Barbara Stanwyck played in that character that everybody was trying to figure her out, and uh, only Fred McMurray did at the very end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's the shoplifter and he's the prosecutor. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> well, it's criminal and the law, and then you know the beauty of that film is that they change places. You yeah, I, Lady Eve plays uh, obviously a lot with duality as well, and, and I think that all the biblical allusions in there, which you know, I think I pick up on different things every time I see it. Um, they switch places. Uh, Henry Fonda and Barbara Stanwyck change places to me in that as well well supposedly and i'm not calling my dad's work to these these terms but apparently one of the definitions of a, of a masterpiece is that every time you experience it you get more from it i i i would agree with that um you listen to uh um i don't know the beethoven violin concerto the wrong note concerto and there's always something stunning in there that you missed the first time or the first 50 times. And I think that's, that's the case with this picture. Cause I saw it very, uh, I saw it very recently 
as part of, uh, you know, approving for uh, the DVD package that we're talking about. And uh, there are things that just, I mean, it's the the little the little details, you know, when uh, when he has uh, Charles Coburn finds Barbara Stanwyck uh, crying on her bed, and she mm-hmm. goes, "I hate that mug." And he says, how many times have I told you never fill to an inside straight? Yes. And it's, just, it's, like, it's like so exactly what a con artist would say to his con artist daughter. You know, don't, right. don't go, go for the easy money. Don't, don't, don't try and fill to an inside straight. It's, just, it's so brilliant. Um, I think something that stood out to me uh, that I hadn't thought of before when she drops the apple on his head uh, mm. in the beginning uh, in about how he's he's resisting uh, the apple, he's resisting the temptation, and um, you know, obviously the film is filled with all of those little things, with the the allusions to snakes and even the oh, um, right the sna- come on the snake. If you go back, I mean, that's I haven't read the Bible in a long time, but I mean, isn't that the whole thing? A snake, an apple, uh, a guy and a girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, well, and of course the the book that he's reading, um, "Our Snakes Necessary," is a oh, favorite. fantastic! <laughs> Which I know is a, um, an, a an allusion to the James Thurber book, "Is Sex Necessary?" Um, <laughs> but oh, I was going to ask: Did you know Brian De Palma has written or co-written a kind of a pulp novel called "Our Snakes Necessary"? I think it's publishing this year. Oh, fantastic! Which of course has to be. It has to be a tip of the hat, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Kind of like um, "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?" with the Coen Brothers. I was going to mention that as fake books go, uh, the fake book in Sullivan's Travels. Um, that's uh, you know, I love I love "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?" and uh, I, what is the? I think it's uh, Sinclair Beckstein is the uh, or Beckstein. Uh, so it's a play off uh, John Steinbeck and Upton Sinclair possibly Upton Sinclair. Not, uh, or or Sin- Sinclair Lewis uh, might, yeah it must be one of those possibly um in your book i in speaking of Sullivan's travels uh, you had uh, called it an anti message film with a powerful message and um to me that kind of resonated cuz you could say the same about Lady Eve what do you think the message is in the Lady Eve I think how it ends is very subversive. <laughs> it's, it doesn't have a, a pat resolution, and it, it's it's a lot like the end of. Uh, and I know Roger Ebert said this too uh, about the, like the end of Some Like It Hot. Um, it's just right. he, he's, he's ostensibly <laughs> committing adultery with how how we leave him. Um, so he he has you know been taught his lesson. But even for her, for uh, for Jean slash Eve, she's not. I, I feel doomed for her. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's a very interesting thing because my dad, um, uh, my dad had a number of personalities, but uh, one of the worst of them was him, the jealous man. And he was a he was a terribly jealous person. Um, and my mom, I remember uh, he'd been dead for twenty years, so I would be twenty three at this time, and just home from college and I was talking with my mom, his fourth wife. And, uh, I said, what was the toughest thing about living with daddy? Um, and she just instantly, instantly she goes, Oh, his jealousy. It was impossible. And I said, Oh, you're kidding. And she described one day when they were at the players and a waiter who was closer to her age than his made her laugh. And it sent him into a what she called a black rage that oh. lasted for days. Wow. And, yeah. And you, I, there's a couple of his films where he has played with that aspect of himself. One is uh, Unfaithfully Yours, obviously, um, mm-hmm. where the conductor just is beside himself at the idea of, uh, you know, somebody – uh toying with his wife, you know, his secretary messing with the wife. But the other one is this film. And that amazing scene in the train where she realizes he's a jealous man and she just lays it out for him, you know, 
one after another all the affairs that have preceded him to this room. Right? That's, that's a, one of my favorite scenes also. <laughs> John? It's, who's John? Oh, it's yeah. edited so well. Like, yeah, it's oh. perfect. <laughs> and uh, uh, and the, the, the one where it's just such a complete insult, he goes, Cecil? She says, it's pronounced Cecil. <laughs> yeah. Which is so insulting, right? Like, not only do I remember the, my previous lover, I remember and respect him enough to pronounce his name correctly. Oh, <laughs> right. God. Yeah, yeah I'd have to correct you, yeah. Um, oh, yeah you know, that I, was, I was surprised to read that in your book because um, you include uh, uh, correspondence or, or uh, reference to correspondence with your mother. Uh, you know, because we, we experience people's art uh, and creativity and uh, divorce from who they are as people and to you know to to learn how he behaves towards your mother for instance and things you would say it, it's surprising considering in comparison to a character like Eve right well this is why I'm saying he was able to toy with that to a, when he wasn't in uh, well listen I gotta be honest I I never met the man uh, so he died when I was three. The last time I saw him, I was one. It's, uh, the last time I saw him is the first picture in the book. Uh, right. I think I left for Hollywood, uh, uh, the next day or two days later or something. So I real, I, I never experienced his anger or his rage. I always imagined he would have been a very nice guy to me and I certainly hope so. Um, yeah. But I do know that that was one of, uh, you know, one of his weaknesses was his jealousy. He also felt that uh, teamwork was when everybody did it his way. Um, and <laughs> I think these are probably traits that allowed him to be who he became, but at the same time became very grating on people later on, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so... That was, uh, you know, his his loss, I think. Um, but it was his belief in himself that got him to that spot where he he was the first guy to direct his own movie. His right. belief in himself, and that didn't. There was an opportunity he had where he could have jumped off that train and and been a a, a film executive and helped other guys, and he was not interested. He only was interested in his own work. So. Well, you, you, what he accomplished, I think, was important, too. Because when I think of Preston Surges, to reference, like, Janet Jackson, he's a story about control. He, he's a story about what a film can look like if you <laughs> have creative control. Did you say reference to Janet Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's such, a good, that's such a good line from that song. It works in so many ways. But, uh, yeah. yeah, he's... And, you know, I've had movie nights for, like, personally with amongst friends and trying to uh, describe to someone that hasn't seen, like, Lady Eve or uh, Sullivan's Travels. And they're, they're really non-classifiable because each time I've shown his films to other people, the reaction is it wasn't what I was expecting or they're completely resistant to some things about it, like like trying to sell Lady Eve. Like, if you like bringing a baby, you like Lady Eve. And it's right. not... It, Press you can't changes. sell it that way. You can't. It's, yeah. It's. it's it, I think he is on an island, and if you start with, if you go back to, um, if I were king, right? Uh, when he's really starting, like he's rejected the idea of writing with anybody else. He says, "No, I'll do all the writing by myself. I don't need anybody else." And he reels off Diamond Jim. If I were king, uh, remember the night in Easy Living. Mm -hmm. I mean, and these are four spectacular screenplays. Yeah. Um, and then, but you can't compare them. I don't know. You just, it, they are, it's his own art and his own way of speaking and giving characters life. And probably part of it was because he wanted to be a playwright. So he knew that every line had to matter. And I think you see that in some of his protégés, like if you see a James Brooks, Jim Brooks uh, film, I think he took that same inspiration from my dad, and every line matters. There's not one wasted, so how are you doing? You know, none of that. It's just... Right. 
Um, oh, even even like even the in the periphery uh, of the audio, like the, when you first see uh, the ship and the 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 cameras panning, and just you pick up on the tidbits of people's conversations. Everything is <laughs> <laughs> like it's chock full. Everything, everybody's doing something. The the butler humming, um, which, you know, which is is, is rare. So my dad, I mentioned this. You know, I did a. Uh, there's a thing on the DVD. Have, uh, do you have a copy of the DVD yet? Yes. Yeah. So yeah we did this little thing called uh, Tom Sturgis and Friends. Have you seen that? On yet? the extra feature. On the extra features. Yeah. Yeah. yeah with the the part with you and Bogdanovich and Jane Bell Brooks. Uh, who else is on it? Ron Shelton. Right. There was yeah. one mm-hmm. thing that we discussed that we're edging onto in this discussion, and that was my discovery through all my dad's writing and everything else that he hated jokes, <laughs> and and never and even though he's he's renowned for his humor and making people laugh and everything else, he never ever told a joke. That was not his his way of doing it. What he told was the truth. And if you look at almost, and, and even the most hilarious moments of his pictures, nobody's making a joke. People are speaking their truth. You right. Know, right. You, and, that's, uh, and that's what I think, one of the things where you can't compare him, because he was the only guy, I think, doing that. You know, there's a scene um, in The Lady Eve, for instance, uh, <laughs> where... Uh, Using this uh, system, my dad also wrote. Um, it was she called it the hook system because it was more like the way people spoke. You know, one person uses a word, another person uses the same word back and forth. So mm-hmm. he says, um, "Let's just see who's that." Somebody calling from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. Um, <laughs> Not Louisiana. So, exactly. Paris, France, New York, Rome. So there's a scene where they're sitting there and they play cards the first time. And he says, uh, he says, uh, let me just see if I can get the exchange right. Uh, she, he says, uh, your father's a, a, a pretty good card player, but, uh, I thought he was a little uneven. Oh, and yes. She responds and says, well, He's more uneven sometimes than others. And he comes back and says, well, of course, that's what makes him uneven. And it's, uh, yeah. it's right. And it's, it's hilarious, but it's just too speaking the truth. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I, there, all those like uh, Charles Coburn's early line, like, let us be crook, but never common. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, oh, right. yes. And, or, or the weirdness in the exchange with, uh, where the the next morning and he's ordering scotch and soda and getting yes. his coffee. <laughs> right. Don't you take cream in it? Yeah. And it is. And a guy who's swept off his feet like that. And uh, and even when she's describing, you know, that beautiful scene where she's like touching his hair and, uh, and she's got him sitting next to, uh, she's on the chaise and he's sitting next to her and they're talking about her ideal. Yeah. Like what her mm-hmm. ideal man is going to look like. I mean, the practical yeah. ideal. <laughs> yeah. Mine is the practical ideal. You see two or three of them getting the works at every barbershop. Yeah. You know? And then he says, well, well why don't you marry him? I said, why would I marry somebody like that? Right? It's this, <laughs> it's this, it's this gorgeous truth that he gives people, uh, to say. So, I'm, I, I, and I, so I don't know how you can compare him. I mean, I, I just say, you know what, here's a, here's an island of, creative mastery of film that a lot of people tried to get on, but here's the guy who founded the island. And, right. you know, and, and you can't, and I try when I'm like seeing my dad's films, especially people who haven't seen him before, I don't say anything. I think that's the best way. I, did, I don't say anything. I'm saying like, you're going to just have to trust me that this is a film that's worth seeing and, and say no more. Right. And because you, you know, especially if you're showing these for people. I mean, obviously you have an expertise in film, and people are going to trust your opinion. But the, I find but, that the less said, the better for me. 
I agree because trying to, you just can't tell it. The, like Sullivan's Travels, I think the first time I showed that to some friends of mine were kind of distressed at how, you know, that there's, it's, it's really, there's great unhappiness in that film. It's not, all, it's not a frothy comedy, you know. <laughs> Because, you know, like, the thing with Preston Surge's films, a lot of them show up on, you know, best comedies ever made, et cetera. And it, it's really kind of misleading because they, they're more uh, poignant than that. They're not operating on the superficial level of easy escapism. Not at um, all. It's, but this is where it goes back to the truth, right? So yeah. in Sullivan's Travels, for instance, um, nobody had ever, and this is a point nobody needs to know about ever, but... Um, there were more black people in that film than uh, it is believed than any film that had been made to that point. Oh right? yeah, when they, get, when they get to the church, and there yeah. the, and the preacher is not obsequious, and he is not uh, having the he's not being run down by anybody. He's not yes, he, he's just he's a man speaking his mm-hmm. truth, right? Turn down, move your chairs, and uh, let our guests take their seats. You know, I mean, it's it's fantastic truth, and I bet that shocked a lot of people. Here's a black person being treated as an equal in this film. Yeah, and I, I guess yeah. Now that I think a bit about it, because because the Lady Even Sullivan's travels are both forty one, so yeah, there weren't. Imagine uh, making those two movies. Imagine I, I know in, in the same year. <laughs> In the same year. Yeah, it's crazy. And, that, and his, uh, in Sullivan's Travels, that, that beautiful opening scene, that's all one piece of film, by the way. If you go back and look, it's as soon as they exit the little screening room, right? And the oh. whole thing, uh, it, it was held over for a fifth week in Pittsburgh. Well, what do they know in Pittsburgh? They know what they like. If they knew what they like, they wouldn't live in Pittsburgh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Right, oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. but that whole scene, the camera moves around the room, following these guys. So even when they make a mistake, one of the film executives makes a mistake. Um, they, it's in, it's in there. When he goes, hey, that, who, who's talking about taking off salary? He floods his line, doesn't look at the camera, keeps on going because you. It, it's, and I think other directors probably would have said cut and let's go back and get that again or do it in close up. But that was the pl- sort of him being a playwright first where you, you make mistakes. Right. Yeah. Right? And, you and you, you and, the line and you gotta, you gotta step back and take care of business. Yeah. Show goes on. Keep going. Do you have a favorite um, of my dad's? Is it this I, one? I, you know, the, the argument always comes down to Sullivan's travels versus Lady Eve for me, but. Uh, I, I think Lady Eve uh, has the edge, if mostly for Barbara Stanwyck's performance, for me. Right. Um, c- you know, because I, I'm a big fan of hers, and she she didn't get a, a lot of opportunities to be uh, in the comedic realm, and she's not always remembered, I think, for her range. Because, uh, you know, we always talk about double indemnity. and But, la- you know, Lady Eve plays to me like the the counter to her character and performance as baby face in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. Right. Uh, and, you know, she just had this kind of sexuality and, and, and brazenness about her that was ahead of her time. And, you know, uh, for well, Lady she Eve, was so of, naughty in the Lady Eve. Oh, say what you were going to oh, say. Say what you were going to say. Oh, like the, the first uh, time she's uh, dressed by Edith Head uh, in this film and, and, you know, the costume choices uh, it, are impeccable, I think. Uh, but yeah, like the, the, the sensuality is <laughs> surprising. Well, she was, uh, you know, imagine poor me. Uh, I was raised seeing that film. You know, my mom would show it on the living room wall. Uh, and that's what beauty was to me, was that yeah. woman. And, yeah. uh, and I don't think, by the way, I don't think she made a ton of comedies. And she, she and my dad, after Remember the Night, I think his promise to her, because what he was trying to do was he was trying to get her in bed. Uh, uh-huh. And she wanted nothing to do with him. I, I found a letter of his that describes that she wanted nothing to do with him. And um, wow. he uh, and apparently he had failed her two-minute test. And he's wow. like, what test? And she explained to him that women know within a couple of minutes if they're ever going to go to bed with a guy. And... Uh, <laughs> 
And he said to her, if I had known there was going to be a test, I would have studied. And uh, <laughs> so they just had all this brilliant, flirtatious chit-chat throughout because they're both the Paramount. And then he said, I'm going to write a nice comedy for you. And that was The Lady Eve. It's the film yeah. he promised her he'd write. I, I, I had read that. Um, and, you know, you take, like, bits of trivia you, you read with a, a grain of salt um, as to their sources. But uh, I, I also... That happens, to be, that happens to be a real piece of trivia. Is it tr- the part The part where she's on the phone with Eugene Pallet, where she's trying to make Henry Fonda apologize to her, um, I had read that somewhere that that was... Your father was basing that on... He had a similar conversation with the Hutton during uh <laughs> is that true when we finally have a chance to make some honest money <laughs> <laughs> right another beautiful yeah. line from charles coburn you've got him right where you want him sure. <laughs> um well my dad uh was offered a big chunk of money by the huttons to just walk away from their daughter mm-hmm. and he was he did not want them to think for a second that he was in it for the money. So even though Eleanor Hutton had basically bankrupted him because she only knew how to do one thing, which was how to shop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and that was it. And I, and by the way, I have the checks. I, I see her, I have hundreds of checks signed by Eleanor Hutton and it's to, uh, it's to, uh, like retailers. I don't know. I, don't, I think it's a bond with Teller and I mean, just like all these spending hundreds of dollars. And he he didn't have beat money. He had playwright money. He made a couple hundred grand, but she was from, you know, millionaires. So, right. But wow. he didn't want. So there is some truth to it that uh, he didn't want to uh, he didn't want to uh, appear to have been interested in, in it for the money. Which, so. which I find I find so interesting the fact that that is written in the Barbara Stanwyck character because she, she's the power player. He's, he's, you know, given her part of him, which I find fascinating. Right, and um, she said, I'll return the jewelry. I don't want anything. I just want to see him again. Yeah. And then there's that, and then you hear, you know, that whole, that, that last beautiful trigger where, uh, where, wh- no, no, where's he going? And then you see her look at her beautiful little diamond watch and knowing that she's going to, and you, if you don't know that movie, you don't know what's happening, but then, da, 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 ba, da, di, da, di, da, which is the theme of the boat. That's boat music. Right? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And the moment you hear that, like they fade out on her and, and then you hear that music and you're like, oh shit, we're back on the boat. And there she is. And it's like, oh. And she trips in the same way she did it the first time. And, um, wow. So there's two things I wanted to mention to you that, um, where you see my dad's mind at work in terms of his film making. You remember the first scene, the first time where she trips him mm-hmm. and, uh, she trips him and then she says, now look what you've done. You're going to have to take me right down to my room and get me a new pair of slippers. <laughs> and, yeah. Right, and he says, and she, and then she, as they're walking out, she says, "Funny, our meeting like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? There's an, I found it in uh, the papers at UCLA. There was a line that he wrote where one of the waiters turns to the other waiter who was helping him get up, and he says, "Like Grant took Richmond." <laughs> Right, without a shot. Uh, mm-hmm. That if you choose, and I guess he felt it was too, you know, it was too much of a gag, or nobody would remember a Civil War general in a particularly important battle. So that was good. But the other thing he took out that he wrote and shot, and it stayed in the film until right before the release, was there's a scene. Uh, if you know the film, you know the boat docks and. And he pulls out the wadded up check, and the, yeah. and Gerald goes, "Oh, two slice with a hot iron, it'll be as good as new." Yeah. He wrote a scene where she takes that check to the bank oh. and cashes it. 
and uh, you see the Henry Fonda character jumping out of a cab to approve the check because it's such a large amount, right, $25,000. And that's, and they, they look at each other, but they don't say anything to each other. But it was like a, a very angry, angry scene, as you would if you, somebody had ripped you off. Right. right. Even if you had all the money in the world, it wouldn't matter. You'd still be so. But he must have felt that it was too too much anger, so he cut that scene out, and you go right from the boat docking to the horse race. Oh, you know? okay. But yeah, in between, it, there was that scene, the missing scene at the bank. Interesting. If you have my screenplay books that I put out, you know, I did the uh, the five screenplays, the four screenplays, and the three screenplays. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it, you can read that scene in the uh, in the book. Oh wow! Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that. Um, which I guess yeah makes it a, a little more. It keeps it lighter and uh, a little more ambiguous. But at, even mm -hmm. watching it again, I was like, God, that is such a, a large amount. I can't believe even in 1941 that nobody would have. Like you could just cast that. Right. Um, yeah, could I cast it? But then again, my dad was making you know seven grand a week. As a writer, director, he's making seven grand a week. That's nice. What? That's, that, you take that. You take that today, right? <laughs> I mean, they used yeah, seven grand, yeah, that, that's three three fifty when a car costs a couple of grand. Yeah. You know? And Bob Hope was making all that same kind of money, except Bob Hope bought all of North Hollywood. Mm -hmm. He bought a lot every two weeks. He bought a lot, and the next lot, and the next lot. Ended up, you know, ended up a billionaire. Wow. So, did did you ever see the remake? Because uh, the Birds and the Bees, the remake of Lady, Lady Eve, with the, that Jerry Lewis, and I think Mitzi Gaynor, and I haven't seen it, yeah. but uh, David Niven. I, I didn't even know that it existed until I was reading through your book. No, not much of a film. No, it's, I. I can't imagine that it would be, I, unfortunately. But um, I, I, one of the last things I wanted to mention uh, is going through it again, rewatching Lady Eve, are all of the other things. Because it's been probably five years since I've seen it. And then when you revisit something like this, and which has had substantial influence on other filmmakers, uh, I, I was, there's this, you know, the scene where... Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda are riding the horse, and she's basically recycling oh. his line. Uh, oh, and the horse fantastic. is nudging him. Oh, yeah, it's hilarious. Um, hilarious. I I thought of um, Spielberg's uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. There's a scene with Kate Capshaw where she's a, I think it's an elephant that's hitting her, much like the horse is hitting Henry Fonda. Right, of course. And pulls a python. <laughs> Which right. I, that, I feel like that has to be a, a maybe a to. homage. It has to. I mean, there's so many homages to him, particularly the Coen brothers, where oh, right. not only naming O oh Brother Warto, but in every film there's something. And the one they did with George Clooney, where uh, all the meetings took place at the Japanese restaurant that the players became. Right. I mean, there's there's little things and. You know, I'll see a scene in a movie. We were watching, uh, we were watching, uh, what film was it? Uh, Something's Gotta Give, uh, Nancy oh, Myers that. film with Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson. And I'm thinking yeah. this lady had, had, had to have watched a number of Preston Sturgis films and tried to pull this off. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's, uh -huh. it's harder than, it, it's harder than it looks. It's like a good magician. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, yeah, you just pulled that card out of my ear. I, it's got to be harder than it looks. You know? uh, well, especially something like Lady Eve. Where, you, you know, if you say he didn't like jokes, and, you know, jokes have a punchline, and then you you laugh. Like, this is, you know, it's much more sophisticated, and it's a, it's a fine balance to, to put yeah. that together. Well, if you keep uh, people speaking the truth, and you and you adhere to that as the creator... I mean, but if you look, I mean, all the great artists who came up around the same time my dad did and who were uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, same thing, right? Yeah. He, doesn't, he wasn't creating fantasies. He was writing his truth. Uh, Picasso, uh, not comparing my dad to, to Picasso, of course, but he had a truth that nobody else had. 
right? And right. if that puts you know, your eyes on the side of your head and your nose coming out of your chest, that was his truth. Yeah. You have to come I mean, over to him. He's not coming to you. I think, you know, it's a different medium, but I think those, those comparisons are valid and for what, for what Sturges did for the craft of screenwriting, even alone. Um, you know, I think that's how somebody like a Billy Wilder was able to kind of pivot the same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, it, it, it's important. There's a letter from, there's a letter in the UCLA files somewhere, uh, that F. Scott Fitzgerald had written and the person sent F. Scott Fitzgerald letter to my dad because he said, as my dad was just starting out, he said, there's something happening in Hollywood. They let this one guy do everything, and it's going to change <laughs> film forever. Hey, this is Eric from MyOwnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.